Good morning, church family. Can everyone hear me all right? I am looking in the chat and I don't see anyone that says otherwise, which is a good sign. Thank you, Arthurine. If at any point during the sermon you cannot hear me anymore, please let me know because chances are I will not notice and I will keep on talking. So with that being said, I think we're ready to begin. Now, as some of you may know, I am studying law. I am going into my third and final year, praise God. And so I thought it'd be appropriate to begin this sermon with a few disclosures. Now, there are some preachers that stand before their congregation and they reveal historical facts of biblical days. They will put verses in a whole new context. But if I'm being honest, I was never one for history. And there are other preachers who are so well-versed in Hebrew or Latin that they make you read the words you've read before in a whole new light. And to tell you the truth, I haven't taken a single Hebrew or Latin class a day in my life. And there are preachers who have gone to school to train, to deliver messages that you would hear at this very hour, and you would call them pastors. But I am not a pastor. Now, before you hang up and you switch to a sermon from Toronto or from Malton, which is very easy to do in these days, here's my proposal. Far be it from me to stand before you and tell you exactly what God wants to do. I don't profess to know the ins and outs of his will. Now, I wish I could do that for you, but if it's all right, I'd like to take this time to share some thoughts on a story from one of my favorite books. And I'm going to tell you about some of the more interesting choices that I've made along my journey of faith and how those choices have strengthened my walk with God. And my hope and my belief is that through this shared experience of me being transparent and sharing some verses with you, there will be something that you can relate to or learn from. And all of this will be done in the next 40 minutes, so you can start your timers now. And our story begins in 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 11. And I'll give you a second to turn to that if you have your Bibles with you or you have your app. It's 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 11. Don't worry if you don't have it. I will read it out. Now, in the King James Version, it says, But Naaman was wroth, and he went away and said, Behold, I thought. He will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord, his God, and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. Now, in another version, in the New International Version, verse 11 says, But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord, his God, wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. Now, I told you that I wasn't one for history, and for that reason, we're not going to study the entire story of Naaman. In fact, we're probably only going to focus on one or two verses. And I'll do you one better if you'd like. I'll give you the takeaway. Naaman was a man who thought. Now, for a bit of background, he's described as a great man who was plagued by a skin disease called leprosy. Now, in those days, there was no known cure for leprosy. But Naaman was introduced to the idea of healing by a young servant girl. And on her word, Naaman approached his master, who then sent a letter to the king of Israel so that he could be cured. The king was at first distraught, but Elisha, a prophet of God who heard about this, sent for Naaman. And he said, Naaman, come by my place. Those might not have been in his exact words, but Elisha sent for Naaman. And Naaman, who originally intended to see a king, wasn't even greeted by Elisha. He was greeted by Elisha's messenger to tell him, this great man, to wash himself in the Jordan River so that he would be cleansed of his leprosy. Now, I'll remind you that Naaman at this point, very frankly, had nothing to lose. There were no doctors who could help him, and it wasn't as though there was a pharmacy handing out remedies to his leprosy. The man had no plan B. But verse 11 says something interesting. It said that Naaman went away angry and said, surely I thought, surely I thought that this prophet of God was going to greet me himself. 
Surely I thought that he'd wave his hand and I'd be cured on the spot. And speaking of rivers, surely I thought that the river Abana or the river Farpar were much better than the river Jordan. And verse 12 says that Naaman went off in a rage. This is where our message begins. But first, I'd like to have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for the ability to join your congregation at this time, to still meet in these days and these times and be able to share your word. And as we dive into the message for today, I pray that nobody will hear my voice. I hear that instead, they will come to get the message that you have intended for them and they will hear nothing but your voice and your will in that moment. Amen. Now, I find it easy to look at the story of Naaman and laugh. Hindsight is a funny thing, but like most things in life, it's funny until it happens to you. So this tale was pure comedy to me until I was confronted with Naaman-like behavior in myself. Now, about two weeks ago, I was saying grace for my family, and I prayed what I thought was a standard kind of prayer. I said, Dear Lord, please bless this food that we're about to eat, make it do our body good, give us strength, nourish us, and please provide for those who don't have in any way you see fit. Give them shelter and your protection. Thank you, amen. Now, as soon as I opened my eyes, I caught this look on my dad's face. And it's a look that I've come to quickly identify and fear over the years. It's a look of deep concentration and preparation that comes right before you're about to be hit with a lesson. And it's a look that says he's gathering his thoughts. He's focusing his will and he's probably drawing on a higher power to give him strength for the fight that he's about to pick. Sorry, for the lesson that he's about to impart. His look says, get comfortable because we're going to be here for a while. Now, I hadn't been finishing praying for five seconds when I saw my dad in this state. So I knew two things immediately. At one, this look was probably targeted at me and my prayer. And two, I had about five seconds to prepare my defense. And my dad, without even giving me those five seconds, turned to me and he said, that was an interesting prayer. Now, I've spent some time with my dad over the years. And after all that time, I can safely say that that was not a compliment. So I said nothing. I was trying to figure out how someone can screw up grace. I say it three times a day, every single day, and I have my entire life. So I was tracing back my words and I was trying to figure out where I went wrong. And while I was thinking back, my dad did me a kindness and he provided me with my error. He said, so you asked God to do something, and then you proceeded to tell him exactly how you'd have it done. You said, provide for those people as you see fit, give them nourishment and protection. Now, in that moment, I will be honest, and I'll say that I wanted to roll my eyes because I doubt that anyone was seriously harmed by my grace. But of course, this wasn't a lesson about grace. It was letting, it was a lesson about letting God be God. So today, what I'd like to do with my time is talk to you about Naaman-like behavior. And I define this as actions that would place you between God and his will. And for me, they can come in everyday passing thoughts. And they're actions that I certainly didn't realize I was doing, but that still stood in the way of God, that tried to control God. And one quick identifier is that in those moments, when you're looking back on things that you've done, you'll say, but I thought. So today I only have three points on how to overcome Naaman-like behavior. And they are one, break it down. Two, use the pause. And three, let it go. And this is all in the hope that you will not be the thing that's standing in the way of you and your blessing. So the first point is to break it down. Now, I've already told you about some of my limitations. I told you I am no historian, I am not a linguist, and I am not a pastor. 
So when I say break it down, I want to be very clear that I am not talking about dancing in any way, shape, or form. I'm probably the last person you want to teach you how to dance. That's another limitation of mine. So when I say break it down, what I'm referring to is your goal or your expectations. Now, there is a tale of a man who wasn't able to break it down. He let his vision and his expectations get in the way and it had terrible consequences. You see, this man was trapped in his house during a flood and he began praying to God to rescue him. And he had this vision in his head of God's hand reaching down from heaven and lifting him to safety. Now the water started to rise in his house and his neighbor urged him to leave and offered him a ride to safety. But the man turned to his neighbor, looked at his pickup truck and said, you know what, go on without me because I'm waiting for God to save me and I know that he will. So the neighbor drove off. But this was a steadfast man. He was a believer and he continued to pray and he continued to hold on to his vision. And as the water began to rise in his house, he had to climb up to the roof. And on the roof, he saw a boat go by with some people who were heading for safe ground. The people in the boat yelled at the man to grab a rope that they were ready to throw to take him to safety. But the man looked at the rope, he looked at the boat, and he said, nah, I'm good. I'm waiting for God to save me. I am faithful and I know that he will come. And the boat left. The man continued to pray on this roof, believing with all of his heart that he would be saved by God. And the floodwaters continued to rise. And then a helicopter flew by and a voice came over the loudspeaker saying, here, we have this ladder. We can take you to safety if you just grab hold. The man looked at the ladder. He looked at the helicopter and he said, you know what? I trust God still. He's going to save me. And the helicopter flew away. So the flooding water came over the roof. It caught up this man and it swept him away. And he drowned. So when this man reached heaven, he said, God, why didn't you save me? I believed in you with all my heart and I prayed. Why did you let me drown? And God said, I sent you a pickup truck. I sent you a boat and I sent you a helicopter and you refused them all. And in my imagination, the next words out of this man's mouth were, but I thought, I thought you were going to come in this way. Imagine telling God that you thought you knew best. Hey God, like I know you're all powerful and everything, but I thought you would do it a different way. Again, hindsight is 2020 and it's pretty funny when it happens to someone else. So let me bring you an example closer to home. All my life, my friends and family have told me that my parents had the perfect relationship. And that's exactly what I saw. Two people who always joked around, loved each other, sacrificed for each other, and who took care of their family. So when I thought about my future, that's exactly what I wanted, a relationship like my parents. Now I'd placed myself in a dangerous position because I had a literal picture of what I wanted. I knew my dad would cook for my mom if she was tired. That was a check I needed to fill. And I knew that my mom always seemed to know exactly what my dad needed and she would make that happen for him. Another check. Now, at the end of the day, I am a praying woman and I did want a God-centered relationship, but that also came with a checklist. So I had a whole future planned for myself and all I was really looking for was a person I could plug into my plans. Now, we know that there's a danger in idolizing a certain person or a certain relationship or anything for that matter, because if anything goes wrong with that idol, your whole plan crashes. For example, think of any celebrity couple or your favorite couple on a TV show. It can be exciting to see pictures of them together, to see how great they look or the life that they've built. And you may even set some goals for yourself based on what you see. But the moment that couple breaks up, you're left thinking, but I thought, I thought they were perfect together. I thought they were gonna last forever. And now that you've spent your life or some of your goals and ideals, modeling them after these people's plans and their life, 
What hope does that give you if theirs doesn't work out? Your dream won't seem as sweet anymore because your dream was always attached to something else and to someone else. Now, the danger in having the whole picture planned out for yourself is that you frequently get attached to the details. You have that checklist that you've made and you can lose yourself in it. See, the man on the roof had a picture and he had a vision and that made him unable to see God when God appeared in his life. And you might have a checklist, but are you able to abandon it if it doesn't match up with God's will? Now, I'm not saying you can't have goals for yourself or that you shouldn't set standards. Uh, me and my type A personality, I would not be able to survive without it. And thankfully, the Bible does back this up. From Isaiah to Luke, the Bible mentions that the noble make noble plans. In Luke, it talks about making plans and seeing projects through. And that's good as long as you remember what it says in Proverbs. Because Proverbs 16.3 says, commit to God whatever you do and he will establish your plans. And Proverbs 3.6 says to trust in the Lord with all of your heart, to lean not on your own understanding and in all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. So setting a goal isn't bad, provided that your goal is rooted in him. So long as you're prepared to submit that goal to God and leave it there. So what I learned to do over time is to break down that picture, to break down the vision of what I wanted in order to decipher what I am willing to bring to God. If I go back to the example of my parents, the goal was previously to have a relationship like theirs. So I broke it down. I said, okay, that might also mean that I want to be married with kids. Can I break that down further? And it would sound something like I want laughter, stability, and joy. And finally, the end result was, I want a partner who can give me that loving relationship. Now that final product, that goal of love, is something that I feel comfortable submitting to God. There's no direction that I've associated with it. No specific person, no specific white picketed fence. It's something that I can reasonably give to him. So I can confidently say, God, I like this idea of love and marriage. In fact, I know from my Bible that it's something you love too. So I'm going to submit it to you. I don't need him by tomorrow. You can take your time. And when you get rid of the picture and you get rid of the details, when you look back, you won't be in a position where when God executes his will, you'll be thinking, but I thought. But I thought he would wash the dishes or I thought she would be able to cook. In those questions, in those cases, the question I want to ask you is, are you able to pivot and accept who God brings into your life? For some of you, the answer might be no. It might be she might, she must be able to cook or he has to wash the dishes. And if that's you, then I encourage you to text me or a pastor afterwards. But when I look at Naaman, I want to ask him to break it down. Again, not in a dance battle. I'm pretty sure Naaman would win and I haven't even seen his moves. I want him to break down his expectations and his priorities, his vision he was talking to a messenger from God. So Naaman, did you really need the hand waving? Did you really need the cleanest water? Where was your priority? Was it the show or was it the healing? So my first point, in order to avoid standing in the way of your blessing, break it down. I told you there are three points and we're on the second. After you break it down, what I wanna emphasize is use the pause. And before I get into that, I want to ask you, again, I won't be able to hear your responses and I'm sorry for that, but I'll pretend like I can. I want to ask you if you know that person who fills in your sentences for you. Now, this is the part where if we weren't on Zoom, I'd wait for the mm-hmms and the oh yes, because I feel like we all know that person, that person who is kind of just waiting on the edge of their seat to tell you what they think that they know you're going to say. And lucky for you, since I can only really rely on my voice right now and I can't hear you, I will admit that I have 
known that person and I have been that person in the past. I could also tell you that it's easy to do. And I'm not sure if anyone has seen Frozen, but there's a duet between Anna and Hans in which Hans says, we finish each other's and Anna interjects sandwiches. Now, I'm not ashamed to say that I saw Frozen in theaters. I am that Disney girl. So at the ripe age of 20 something, I was sitting in the theater with my parents. And for a bit of background, Disney's songs are great in the way that they make you feel like you know the lyrics before you've even heard it before. So it makes you feel like you can sing along the first time that you hear it. Now, me in that mindset at 20 something years old, I was sitting in the theater and when Han said, we finish each other's, there was an awkward moment where Anna said one thing and my grown self audibly said something else in this room full of kids. Now, Hans in the moment said that Anna was right. He said, I, that's exactly what I was gonna say. We finish each other's sandwiches. Honestly speaking, I'm still of the belief that he really meant sentences, but that's another point. What I realized in that moment from my awkward theater experience is that when you're talking, there is a world full of Anna's and Chelsea's who think that they know where you're going. And it means that the possible answer that they're ready to fill can range from sandwiches to sentences and probably beyond. So as I look back on some real world cases, I try to see if I do this in any other context. And I've realized that there are a few. And there are a few when I have been completely wrong in my perception of where things were going. And in those moments, all I could say was, oh, I thought. Oh, but I thought that we were going somewhere else with that we. Oh, I thought you were going somewhere else with that. Oh, but I didn't think it was going to take that turn. That's crazy. And one area in which I see this a lot for myself is when I teach my Sabbath school class. And I've tried to figure out why that is. And what I've come to realize is that when I teach my kids, I have an idea of where I want the conversation to go. I've thought about this subject for hours before I go to them. And I'll usually have a plan on exactly which points I need them to hit for them to get my message. So when I teach them and I talk to them, I'm listening for these trigger words. And it sometimes leads me to a place where when they hesitate, I fill in their sentences for them because I want them to come to the same conclusion as me. Park that for a minute. And I recently realized that if I let them hesitate, if I let the kids pause between their ideas, they will often have more to say. It's just when I think that they're done that they come back for more. They were never really done with their idea. They just needed me to wait. So now I use a conscious pause. Now, if I ask a question, I'll let it linger for a while. And when they answer, I'll leave a little extra time before I respond or before I ask the next question. And I'll say that it is an uncomfortable and unnatural feeling to be okay with silence, but there's so much benefit to it. Because I found that when I do give them time to gather their thoughts, their ideas are so much more creative and nuanced than whatever I wanted to fill in for them. And it's in those moments that we hit a turning point in our conversation. That's when the conversation takes on new heights. Now, waiting is a crucial concept explored in the Bible. From Isaiah to Lamentations, it says, they who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary and they shall walk and not faint. It says that the Lord is a God of justice and blessed are all those who wait for him. And it says the Lord is good to all who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. And I realized that sometimes when we ask God for something, we approach it like I do with my kids. We've thought about the conversation probably for hours before we go to God. We have an idea of where we want that conversation to go. And we're listening for those trigger words, for the words that appeal to us. And at the end of the day, all we really want is for God to get on board with our plans. 
Now note that in my research of Bible verses and Bible stories that deal with waiting, nowhere in that did I find the words that, or the idea that you should fill in words and thoughts for God. The Bible does not invite, nor does it encourage guesswork. So what I'd say is that the more you have to strain to hear God's words in times of silence, the more those words end up sounding like your own voice and your own will. And I'll say that again. In times of silence, the more that you have to strain to hear God's words, the more those words will end up sounding like your voice and your own will. Now, nowhere in my research did it say that God wants you to guess at what he's doing, nor does the Bible encourage testing God in his silence, saying things like, God, if you're not okay with this thing that I want, send me a sign and let me know. Break my ankle or have lightning come and strike my front porch, then I'll know that you don't want me to do this. I would say that God's silence is not his consent nor his approval for you to take that on. And testing God in that is not something that is encouraged. Now, I've told you what not to do during that silence, during the wait. And here's what I would say instead. Use it. So when God pauses, when you ask for something and you hear nothing back immediately, it doesn't mean that he's done. And it doesn't mean that he has nothing more to say. And of course, I don't know what God would or wouldn't do in every situation or exactly what your pause means. All I know for sure is that God is never really done with you. And he always has more to say if you're willing to listen. So while you're waiting, while you're praying for something, use the pause. Use it for a greater purpose. For example, if I ask God for elevation and promotion in my workplace, I want to make sure that if I get that job, I'm equipped with the right work ethic, I have the right motivation, and I have the proper knowledge to succeed in that role. Only then will I be able to bring glory to God's name when I'm in that job. And these things, the work ethic, the motivation, the knowledge, those are things I can work on myself while I wait. By the same token, if I pray for a partner and a relationship, I need to use that pause. Now, when I say using the pause, I don't mean testing out every potential partner to see who fits and who is not a good fit for you. I don't think God needs your assistance in that way. When you use the pause, when you're waiting for that partner, what I mean is that you work on yourself. You work on yourself so that when that person enters your life, you'll be ready. You will have spent time working on eliminating toxic behavior, learning to communicate in a healthy way, and continuing to develop your faith. All with the goal that after that pause, when God finally brings that person into your life, you can treat his child with that biblical love that he wants you to show them. So use the pause to better yourself, to prepare yourself for what you've asked for. There are any number of reasons why God might delay in revealing the next step or the next point in the conversation. And some of those reasons might have nothing to do with you. It could be that your partner isn't ready or there's a different job that's lined up for you. So when there's that pause, you could spend that time trying to understand why God hasn't brought it on yet. Or you could use that time to kind of prompt God and speed things along. Or you could use the pause. You could keep pushing towards and praying for your goal. So to overcome your name and like behavior, I would say first, break it down. And second, while you're waiting on God, use the pause. I've given you two points and here's the third. I'm looking at the time and again, mindful that lunchtime is fast approaching. So this is the last one. And all I have to say is let it go. And this is a very specific step and it's for people who might not have gone to God first. And again, I will admit that I have been in the position where I've 
ask God to assist me after I have not gone to him first. And one of the clearest examples I can see this is when I've asked God to assist me in my dating life. And sometimes I will do this after having made a series of choices that he probably did not ordain. And I say probably not because I really wouldn't know. I didn't ask him beforehand. I mean, hindsight would suggest that he probably wouldn't have ordained it, but that's a different story. When I would go to God, I'd be in the position of being with someone and asking for his help. But of course, I had stipulations. I wanted God to guide me as I stayed in the relationship. So the prayer would sound something like this. God, I know I didn't really consult you before I got into this situation, but I'm here now and I like him and he likes you. He says he goes to church and I know that you're great and you're all powerful and you can do all things. So I'm asking you to do something as long as I get to stay here. Now, at the end of the day, when the relation tur relationship turned out exactly the way it should have, I would have a moment where I sheepishly looked back at God and I would say, oh, you see, but I thought, I thought he was the one. I thought I heard your voice telling me to do that. And again, hindsight is hilarious. Now, in reference to that prayer, I'm not saying that God can't turn your situation around. He is all powerful and he can do it all. What I'm saying is that when you ask God to turn your situation around, you should not be trying to hinder his work. If you ask God to intercede, you can't have your hand on the steering wheel trying to direct where he goes. Now, I pulled the definition of intercede, and it means to intervene on behalf of another. Now, I told you I'm studying law, and I'm studying specifically criminal law. And if you're charged with a crime, you might have a lawyer that you call to intervene on your behalf. And when you do that, you're saying that for the most part, you no longer have to speak in court because there's someone who will help you. You're saying to your lawyer, I trust you. I trust your expertise in this area and I'll let you handle it. And it's an absurd thought to me to picture a lawyer advocating for their client in a courtroom and all of a sudden the client stands up says, you know, lawyer, I think I've got it from here. And actually, Your Honor, I want things done a different way. Again, knowing that the client doesn't know the system or the process, and even sometimes what's best for them. Now, in life, God is the expert. He's the best person to intercede for you and to intervene on your behalf. I wouldn't recommend showing up to court with God and then telling him to take a back seat. It would be like telling God about your problem, asking him for help, and then saying, watch how it's done. Now, there's an amazing song that David and Nathan sang earlier today called Let Go and Let God. It's by Dwayne Woods. And I recognize that song lyrics don't quite compare to the word of God, but I would say that there's so much truth in those lyrics that you can't really let go and let God, sorry, you can't really let God be God and do his work if you don't first let go. Now, in our story, Naaman had a happy ending. I'm sorry if that was a spoiler for you, but he did. He was cured of his leprosy, but he was cured once he followed the exact directions of Elisha. See, his cure, his healing, only happened because he surrendered his will and left his situation in God's hands. God tells us that we can lay down our troubles and our burdens before him. He does not ask us to lay our troubles down and provide him with a master plan on how to overcome it. He does things in his way and in his time. Our only rule is to surrender everything to him and leave it there. So if you give your situation to God, you can't give it to him in part. You either trust him or you don't. And if you trust him, you're saying, Whatever the consequences, I'm leaving it at your throat. And again, to avoid blocking his will, when you ask God for something, first you break it down. Then 
you use the pause. And finally, you let it go. Now, I remember when I was baptized and in that moment, I never felt happier to lose myself because in that moment before Pastor Paul Smith dipped my head beneath the water, I felt nothing and I heard nothing but God. And I know that as time has gone on, I've gotten comfortable in my salvation. And I've become comfortable in this relationship that I have with God. And I know that at times, my will and my voice can get louder than his. But see, I'm a firm believer that God will not shout his will at you. And if that's true, then it's incumbent on us to control our voice and to control our will. And we prepare ourselves so that when God speaks, we're ready. And being ready, that preparation means breaking it down. It means tackling our expectations, the ideas and the pictures that we've constructed that might have us stuck in our way. It means being ready means using the pause. It means being quiet and listening for him and being comfortable with the silence and using that time to better ourselves for his purpose. Being ready means that you're willing to let go of anything that's holding you back. God's plans are so much greater than anything that we can imagine. So I ask you, why hold on to your will and what your mind has come up with when there's something that's guaranteed to be much better for you out there? And that thing is yours if you want it. So when you ask God for a miracle, you ask him for a blessing, and you ask for his assistance, in order to not stand in the way, I would say one, you break it down. And you use the pause. And finally, you let it go. It's not up to you to control how he executes his will. So trust him. He loves you. He's all-knowing. And he's all powerful. Who better to direct your life than God? Don't be Naaman. Don't be the very thing that stands between you and your blessing. Thank you very much. And now, before I log off, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I Thank you for your message. I thank you for the reminder that when we come to you in prayer, when we come to you for your assistance, that you know what's best for us. You are the expert in all things and you can do all things. Let us remember that when we come to you, we should come to you with the purest and the most basic of requests, the things that we need or really cherish in our lives. That although we can come to you with all things, when we when we pray on something and we ask you for something, that it will be something that we've broken down to its purest form. I pray that you'll help us to remember that while we're waiting on you and we're trusting you with your situation, that we will use that time and we will better prepare ourselves so we're equipped to handle anything that you want to bring into our lives. And we pray that you will, that we will remember that at the end of the day, what you have for us is so much better and sweeter than anything our minds could come up with. So help us to let go of anything that's holding us back. Let go of any people that we need to let go of, any expectations, any plans that we have that don't conform to your will. Lord, and as we proceed with things, as we go into a period of transition where we're opening up our church and we're able to see each other and fellowship with each other again, we pray that you will be with us, with us all in terms of our safety and our help. But at the end of the day, Lord, I pray that you will do as you see fit. Amen.